The following is a production of the University of Minnesota. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our 1030 session. Our presenter this morning is Brenda Butterfield from the College of Education and Human Service Professionals from Duluth. And just a couple of announcements to make before the session starts. The session will be videotaped and audio taped. And um, if you don't want to be on camera, that's fine. Um, there will be a question and answer period later. If you don't want to be on camera, you can fill out one of these cards right here and then hand it to me and I'll give it to the presenter. Otherwise, if you would like to answer a question, I'll pass around the mic after the presentation and then you can ask your questions. Otherwise, here is great. Brenda. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> what a fun place to be. Wow, it's just gorgeous this morning and it's, I can just feel the energy. And the people of similar background and a like mind and wanting to internationalize the curriculum. So it's very exciting. I cannot wait to get out and look at all the posters. And talk with people, because I've been too busy setting things up, which is part of Skype. <laughs> uh, it's not my usual um, manner to show up an hour before I teach a class. <laughs> I usually come about five minutes before class, and I turn on my laptop, and I'm good to go. Um, but you can't do that with Skype. Well, you can, but it doesn't work all that well. So, and even with all the planning and preparations, that we've been making over the last two months to make this perfect, <laughs> it will not be perfect. And when, what I've been learning about Skype is you really just turn yourself over. You just surrender. But don't we do that with all technology? <laughs> so I will talk a little bit uh, more about my philosophical approach to teaching and to the use of technology, period. <laughs> so. Anyway, I am Brenda Butterfield. Thank you for the introduction, Mika. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm really excited about this. I see some familiar faces. And Tricia, since you are here from UMD, and Tricia and I have been partnering to internationalize the curriculum at UMD in some really fun and exciting ways. So I want to make sure that we hear from you, OK? Um, I'm going to tell you a story. If I do this workshop like I do my teaching, and like I do most workshops, I will talk too fast. And I'm sorry but hang on, <laughs> we have a lot of ground to cover. And we're gonna to go to England, and then we're going to go to the Middle East. We're going to go to a small country in the Persian Gulf called Bahrain. So we have places to go and things to do. I'm gonna share with you my developmental process for internationalizing the classes that I teach, which really started in earnest about three years ago when I, first, when I went to the first Internationalizing the College Curriculum Conference at UMD. So I'm going to share with you my process, um, hopefully plant some seeds, get some creative thinking going about how you can do the same thing, and then learn from some of you throughout the day as well. My journey of learning about Islam and Arab culture, which is a direction I had so never intended on going in. This is a, a whole new journey for me, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, and then how I am learning to share my learning process with my students through the use of Skype. So I will introduce you to Skype. How many of you know Skype and have used Skype? Look at that. This is great. So we'll just zip through that slide very, very quickly. And then I'm going to introduce you to some colleagues I have. We'll go to England. I've already talked with Shazim this morning. He's sitting, waiting in front of his computer. <laughs> and I'm still trying to track down my friend Miriam, who likes to play with me. <laughs> And she knows that I get very anxious when I can't call her when, and she's not there when she needs to be. So, uh, you know, if all the dots connect, we'll get to meet Miriam as well. And then I'll talk with you about the, some of the pros and cons that I've experienced using Skype. So there are lots of ways to internationalize a curriculum. We all know that. There are many, many ways. I started out with films. And let me say that I teach classes that lend themselves very well to the idea of internationalizing the curriculum maybe easier than some other classes. One is developmental psychology, um, which is how we change and grow across the lifespan. And then the other is marriages and families worldwide. <laughs> so that's a really easy one. But I started out with films, and then I started doing music. So you arrive, you hear the music. I do this in my classrooms as well. Now we're moving into food, <laughs> which is really fun. And the backdrop is 130 to 200 students at a go. So we're talking the venue is a large lecture class which makes it really, really fun. 
And then guest speakers, um, partnering with our folks at UMD in the multicultural department and building on the speakers that they invite to campus, finding out how I can get those speakers to come to my class because that's 130 to 200 people at a go if you want to reach them. And faculty from other countries, so Meek and I were just talking about the alumni within the U of M system. They are potential interviewees that we could connect with. And then partnering with international students, which is what Trish and I have been working to do, um, which has been really very fun. And then there's study abroad, of course. And now Skype. Oprah uses Skype. <laughs> our students know Oprah. How can we use Skype to get our students engaged? All right? So it is free, which is free, 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 free. I still can't believe this. I'm still waiting for a bill. <laughs> it's been several years, and I haven't received a bill. So it really must be free. Um, called landlines, mobile phones. Shazam called me yesterday from his mobile on my computer, and that I, you can do that too, which I didn't know. It's very similar to UM Connect, but Skype works better for me because I don't like technology. <laughs> I don't like computers. I don't like any of it. And so I do all of this kind of reluctantly. And I have to be willing to make mistakes and frankly make a fool of myself, which I do on a regular basis. Um, and then we you turn that into a learning experience as well, right? That's what we do well as teachers. How I became familiar with Skype it, um, really started in earnest. The fall of 2008, I was invited to go to England as part of our UMD study abroad program, study in England program. And I took my family, we went for four months, had a great time. The reason I really wanted to go, um, what I had been there 20 years before as a student, but I went back and I wanted to internationalize my curriculum. And so I taught the same classes there that I teach at UMD, and I knew that I wanted to focus on Islam. And I wanted to find a way to one, learn about Islam and Muslim culture, and two, find a way to get my students to open up to these ideas. Birmingham is one of the most ethnically diverse cities in the world, um, which a lot of people don't know. So I saw this as a salad bar of ethnic diversity. And so I thought, let's go to England and see if we can do this. Skype was not on my radar screen at all. It was more internationalizing the curriculum, raising awareness about the world outside the US, and increasing cultural awareness about Arab, Muslim, not always one and the same, cultural identity. Uh, while we were there, my students, my students from UMD really taught me about Skype as much as I was willing to let them. They were Skyping people back home every day, two and three times a day, and I thought, that's just wrong. <laughs> that should not be happening. When I did study abroad, you know, we didn't even have email, and I got like 10 letters the whole time I was gone, and that was the way it was supposed to be, right? You're supposed to go and disconnect and find yourself. And here my students were all day talking about Skype, and you know, you should use Skype, blah, blah, blah. I was not ready. I was not at all interested because I'm a purist. They find Skype. Um, very interesting, they use it off it to make domestic calls, international calls, personal business calls. I was shocked, but I didn't the whole time I was there. And Greg Fox was the director um, of the program that year and he had Skype set up in his, uh, his flat and he constantly invited me to do it and I was like, no, I, I'm not interested, it's not my thing. Don't teach me. I didn't want to use Skype because it would violate my experience, but I'm also, like I said, technologically resistant. <laughs> That's what this is really all about. So my friend sent me some funny cartoons. Um, can't you do anything right? Because <sighs> my computer often doesn't seem to cooperate with me. I'm a gaper at best. So there will be times when I do things on my computer and I don't know where I am. And I have to call the IT person to come help me. And I share that because some of you probably consider yourself not very technologically savvy either. And that's okay. I think that's the beauty for me of Skype is really anyone can use it, which I, I at this point cannot say about UM Connect because it scares me. There's a lot going on with UM Connect. Um, my resistance to computers in the classroom, technology should not, it, it should enhance but not distract from learning. I have a lot of reservations about online learning and I want to make sure that it's effective and we've got good pedagogy behind it, all of that. Um, so what a school day, the computer broke down. We actually had to read. <laughs> I thought these were funny. 
there aren't any icons to click. It's a chalkboard, right? So as I've been at UMD for seven years, and I've seen this major transition in using more and more technology, and I do it reluctantly, and I do it judiciously. How can I use these features to help enhance my learning, not get in the way of my, of my teaching and my students' learning? Um, I really believe that learning is best supported in human relationships. I think that's the essence of teaching. And so technology should not come between my teachers, uh, between the teacher and her students, which can compromise learning. I want to use the relationship I create with students as a vehicle to affect change. Change in the way they see the world. Change in the way they think. Technology noise can get in the way. Dear Andy, have you, how have you been? Your mother is fine. We miss you. Please sign off your computer and come downstairs for something to eat. <laughs> So sometimes I fail miserably. I do everything right. I love my computer. I embrace technology. I jump off the cliff. And then it still doesn't work. Right? You have to be vulnerable, I found. Um, I was in class on Tuesday, last Tuesday, first day back from spring break. So my students did not want to be there. And you can really feel it in a class of 130. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I'm going to play some upbeat music. Shelly had sent me. Thank you very much, Shelley. I used it in class. A great YouTube clip of some Indian music that was upbeat, alive, it was drumming, it was just, you could feel the energy. And so as they're coming into class, I had this on. And what I didn't realize was that I had actually clicked it three times, <laughs> the YouTube clip. So when it was done and I, I was ready to move on in class, I tried to turn it off and I couldn't turn it off. And I kept trying and trying. And finally my students said, here, I'll help you. And so they come up and they turn it off and we're ready to go. All right. If you are willing to make mistakes, it will work, work out just fine. So what pushed me over the edge? These people. Some of the people that I met in England, the four months we were there, and then family, of course. My sisters lived in Saudi Arabia for over 20 years. This is my sister here in the black with the gold necklace, and this is her family um, in Bahar. In, they actually live in Saudi Arabia. Long story, they came to Bahrain because we couldn't get visas because it was the time of Hajj. So these are the people that really pushed me over. Shazam Hussein is the principal of the um, Al Mahadi Institute in Birmingham. He was the person that I, well, I think that the universe led me to when we were in Birmingham to partner so that I could help internationalize my curriculum for my students. So Shazam is an amazing person. You will meet him this morning. He runs a, he's the principal. So. Um, they run the Al Mahadi Institute, which is a world-class research and teaching institute. He is eager and willing to partner with other faculty members about the, um, the role of Islam. And what I always say, and the way I best describe it, is Islam's been hijacked since 9-11. And Shazam's work at the institute is to get back in charge of driving the airplane of Islam. So they try and really demystify Islam. It's a fascinating organization. He took us on ethnic food outings. He brought my students um, to the mosque for a field trip. We had interactions with the students at the Al Mahadi Institute. It was fascinating. We developed a very nice relationship. After all my teaching obligations were done, we, um, my family and I went to Bahrain to visit my sister, which is a tiny Gulf Island nation in the Persian Gulf, and it's connected to Saudi Arabia by a bridge. So we went, very easy country to get in and out of. We're trying to set up a short-term study abroad program now and take some of our students there in a year. It was a fascinating trip. And I've traveled in many countries around the world in the last 20 years. It's one of the most interesting places I've ever been. It really shook my worldview up in some significant ways. We did some great things and met some amazing people, one of whom is Mary Coons in the pink blouse, and she's written a book that's just been published, I think about two years ago, Culturally Speaking, Promoting Cross-Cultural Awareness in a Post-9-11 World. Oh, there's Shazam. He will probably call me at any moment, <laughs> and then I will shift gears completely, like we always do with Skype, and we'll just go with it. And if he doesn't, then I'll call him, but this is what I've learned is how to use Skype is to not be uptight, just surrender to the whole experience. So I met Mary Coons, who had just written this book, and basically it's about the generalizations that Minnesotans 
because that's where her research was done, make about Middle Eastern folks who are practicing Islam. And the 11 most common generalizations they make about us, which is absolutely fascinating. When I was in Bahrain, Mary was there, so we met. Mary introduced me to Maryam, the um, woman in the black hijab and the abaya. What a phenomenal person. Basically, at the end of our time in England, after we came back from Bahrain, we were in England one more week, and then we came back to Minnesota. The four months had ended. And I started thinking, how can I use the journey that I've been on and everything I've learned to really internationalize marriages and families worldwide in a whole new way? Not just music, not just food, not just guest speakers. I want Mary Coons and Miriam to come to my class. Well, Mary lives here in Hanover, and Miriam lives in Bahrain. So I thought, well, how are we going to do this? We can do it via, via Skype. So we used, I started thinking, I've got to find a way to use Skype in the classroom. And I think this was before UM Connect, which is probably why I went that route and what I knew about. So to interview guest speakers, cultural consultants, to internationalize the curriculum, to facilitate cross-cultural awareness and understanding. I'd been looking at the, some of the findings about anti-Arab sentiment had been rising in this country. Anti-Muslim sentiment is on the increase. And Pew Research Center has done some interesting work in finding this out. Particularly, um, opposing or negative views are rising for college students. So in my mind, it made great sense to focus on the role of Islam in marriage and family practices worldwide. So I invited the women to come to class, and it was time to go in, to slay the dragon, <laughs> to go in and learn about Skype. So here's the class. I jumped off the cliff for the first time that first semester after I got back. And the way we did it was um, I actually invited Mary Kuntz to come to campus, and we did a workshop for the diversity summit that we had that spring. And we had Miriam come and be a co-presenter at the workshop via Skype. My goals for the curriculum, internationalize the curriculum, raise awareness. How was I going to accomplish using Skype in the classroom effectively? I wanted to find a way to do that. To use Skype to meet um, my other learning objectives. And then I wanted to evaluate the use of Skype. I wanted students to tell me if it helped them learn. So I'll share some of that at the end of the presentation as well. Mary came to campus. We called the workshop Demystifying Arab and Muslim Culture with a focus on the Kingdom of Bahrain. The initial goals have, are different than my goals now for how I use Skype in the classroom. Initially, I had to familiarize students with Skype. Believe it or not, there are a fair number of even young people who don't, do not know about Skype, which I thought was interesting. And then I'd say about 25% of the class knows exactly what I'm doing and they, they help me out when I run into a problem. But I had to introduce the technology, I had to interview the guest speaker via Skype, and then what I've been learning is it's a really fun way to introduce my guest speakers in the beginning of the semester and the, via Skype, and then like Mary Coons will come to class, she'll drive up to Duluth, we'll spend the weekend together, she'll actually come to class and then meet the students and give her presentation, and then we'll start talking about Miriam in Bahrain. We'll interview Miriam via Skype. And then last semester, we brought Miriam to campus from the Kingdom of Bahrain. So it was phenomenal. It was, as you know, semesters are 15 weeks long. And we used this as a theme all throughout the semester. And we married it to the UMD International Education Awareness Week. So we sponsored this event, if you will, of Miriam. Al Sharubi coming from Bahrain to UMD. We, I started planting the seeds the very beginning of fall semester. Then we built in Mary Coons, and then Mary came to class, and then we Skyped Miriam, and then we said, hey, let's bring Miriam from the kingdom. <laughs> and so then we brought Miriam over. We opened it up to the entire campus community, and it was a packed event. Large lecture hall, seats about 240, I think, Life Sciences does. And there were probably five or six empty seats. It was really great. We served tea. We had baklava that we'd made all weekend. It was, it was a very effective event, or so students and people who went told me. So now what this has evolved into is not just one Skype interview. It's actually using Skype and embedding these cultural contacts into the curriculum and finding a way to take students on a study abroad experience that is a virtual experience. 
because most of them, many of them, and I know we're trying to get more study abroad, folks, but many of them will never go abroad. But I want them to go abroad virtually. And so now what we're doing is working, um, I'm working with Lindsay Anderson in our International Study Abroad office at UMD, and Lindsay is meeting with students every week from my class who have signed up for an assignment that I've created to get them information about studying abroad. And so we have 15, weeks, 15 students who meet every week with Lindsay for half an hour, and she is using Skype to talk to the students in Birmingham. She is using Skype to interface with people in different countries to get my students ready to study abroad, all via Skype. So it's, it's actually really fun. But we build on this metaphor of going on a journey. What I have found over the last few semesters is my students, like m most of us, um, don't know very much about Islam. So I have, we have to have Shazam come from England, from the Al Mahadi Institute, via Skype, and tell us a little bit about Islam and how Islam varies in practice around the world. So Islam in England is different than the Islam practiced in Minnesota, which is different than the Islam practiced in Saudi Arabia, which is different than Bahrain. So it's helping students see that there's this continuum of religious practice, just like Christianity. Then we have to talk a little bit about Arab culture, tease apart Arab culture from Islam or Muslim culture, because they're not one and the same. And then we talk about geography. Oh, here's where we're going. Oh, did you know it's nine hours ahead? <laughs> now it's good evening. It's a very hot climate. So there's so much more that the students are getting exposed to. Connecting it to the course curriculum, which is where we're going to go right now. I thought, wouldn't it be fun if we actually did this as part of the workshop? This is a new study by the Pew, uh, Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life. One in four people in the world is Muslim. Um, approximately 1.57 billion Muslims in the world, 23% of the total global population. It's the second largest religion in the world, and some reports that I have read suggest that it's the fastest growing. And so that, that gets a little complicated, but just to emphasize that this is a, a significant portion of the world's population we need to understand. We need to build on this, build on our understanding. So there is great diversity within what we lump together as this Muslim community, just like the Christian community, all right? Cultural differences influence how Islam is practiced. There are two Muslim women, one of whom is my sister and her friend. They live in Bahrain, Jerry actually. Uh, so anyway, long story short, but they don't cover. They consider themselves Muslim. Okay, this is my niece who lives in a very conservative part of Saudi Arabia. This young woman here, Tahani, and she covers everything. She wears the niqab, all you can see are the little eyes that peek out. She's Muslim. Women are the young girls in Afghanistan, cover, but it's not black. It's not a black hijab or a black abaya. So we look at how these marriage and family and individual practices vary around the world. They're influenced by Islam, but there's a lot of diversity teasing this apart, teasing this apart, which makes for fascinating conversations in class, which we have in these large lecture classes. This is the best way that I can explain it to my students. Here's liberal religious groups and conservative religious groups. We're all Christian, somewhere along that line. And then if we're all, we all practice Islam, there are liberal religious groups and conservative religious groups. These are the folks we hear about. These are the terrorist, terrorists who have hijacked the religion. That's what we hear, but that's not what Islam is really about. Okay? So there's Miriam on the screen, and there's Mary Coons. This is the first um, use of Skype in the classroom. A one-time interview. And then I realized, oh my gosh, all this background information, my students, I'm assuming they have that they don't have. So now we need to find a way to weave this in all throughout the semester. So we embed the speakers. Like I mentioned, we develop the context, the country, the historical background. It's a familialistic society. It is not like American individualistic society. So we're, and these are themes and concepts that keep coming up all throughout the semester the socio-political context, how religions practice, information about the speakers themselves, 
And I invite students on this journey to build a relationship, because teaching is best facilitated, I think, in relationships. Build relationships with these speakers to demystify who they are. And what students tell me after they meet Miriam via Skype is, because she's this upbeat, gregarious, very funny Arab Muslim woman, and the students are like, I thought they were all very oppressed and very sad and serious. That's not what she is at all. Of course not. Of course not. So using Skype to prepare the speakers or the students in class for the real thing, for the speaker when she comes. Um, and this is a really fun way to engage students. <laughs> it is so fascinating when I get Skype going in the classroom, students are like this. And so one semester I thought, well, this will be kind of fun. I'm going to see what happens when I put my slides up there. So I toggled back and forth between, we were doing marriage ceremony or wedding ceremonies in Bahrain and what they look like compared to wedding ceremonies in this country. Anyway, here's, and I'm not exaggerating, this is what happened when I would toggle back and forth between my slides and the speaker. Here are my slides. Here's the, here's the uh, Skype person. It was Phenomenal. I could not believe the difference in the classroom. And so there's been this process of learning how to engage them. And now the next level is learning how them to, helping them drill down, helping them get so curious that now they want to go to Bahrain. Now they want to go to Birmingham, England. Now they want to go to India. They want to go to these places because, oh my God, it's so different. It's so fascinating. And that was a really nice person I just talked with. She was really funny. So how do I do this? I've learned over the last couple of years, it really works well when you get questions from students prior to the interview. Tomorrow in class, we will be, 130 of us, will be interviewing a group of 20 students from the University of Bahrain. I've partnered with the American Cultural Studies Department. They are the chair of the department. And so we've been communicating via Skype for the last few months. And we've been talking about, do we want to learn from each other? We do. So I've been collecting questions from my students. They write them in class on a piece of notebook paper with no name, nothing on it. My TAs go through and they identify the themes that emerge, which always happen. And then we come up with a list of about 15 questions. We've sent those off to the students in Bahrain. So they've been processing those and they're getting ready. At the same time, they have come up with questions that they're going to ask us. So we'll have this interchange, and it'll be the first time that I've done this in the classroom. Um, so I'll have to let you know how that goes. It'll be very interesting. Oh, it said Buzz Lee was already at home. Oh, was that Shazam? OK, I've got to stop now, because we've got to talk to Shazam. So we sort and identify the themes. I send the speakers the questions ahead of time. And typically, four or five days ahead of time is, is great. They have them, and so then on, on the day in class, we're actually ready, we're ready to go. I always have a backup plan because there have been times when Miriam is stuck in a traffic jam in, Ma in Monoma. She can't get to her computer, <laughs> okay? So you always have a backup plan. I always tell students, inshallah, so in Arabic, God willing, all the planets line up, it'll happen. Think about the time difference. Um, Shazam is six hours ahead. Miriam was nine hours ahead until this morning I found out with daylight saving. Now they're eight hours ahead, so we, I'm hoping we get to connect with Miriam. Be mindful. Miriam is willing to stay up until 3 in the morning to talk to us. I'm not going to do that, OK? Dr. Hillis has brought all of, he's bringing all of his students back to campus at 9 o'clock at night, which will be conducive to us meeting in class. But I don't like to do that very often. Um, there we are. Some pros and some cons. But I think, should we, should we talk to Shazam? Now, would anybody here like to ask him a question? Um, which is what I always invite my students to do as well. If they have a question that they would like to ask, I ask them to come up front. And um, believe it or not, as the semester goes on, students will do that. Oh, that's Miriam. Let's call, let's call Shazam. So I just have my little addresses there. <coughs> Now we're calling Shazam. He's in Birmingham, England. Well, hello, Shazam. Hello. How are you this morning? How are you this evening? 
Alwan and yourself? I'm good. Thank you for waiting so nicely. <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> Would you like to see who you're meeting this morning? Sure. Okay. And of course, you could be really organized and have that little camera set up in your podium in the classroom, but I don't. So here are our workshop participants. <laughs> <laughs> there they are. So if I could, I would just leave the laptop here. But I, yeah, don't, so. I don't want to disconnect anything because Ben's got a lot of stuff going on back there. So um, Shazam, I wondered if <clears throat> you would tell us a little bit about um, your role and the mission of the Al Mahadi Institute in Birmingham, England. Sure, sure. Um, I'm basically the principal, well, at least that's what they tell me. Um, um, the institute tries to, it is an Islamic institute, a Shia Islamic institute, and what we try to do is take the essence of Islamic scholarship and try and interpret it in a, a very modern contemporary way. So in other words, we're, we're trying to use the sort of the essence of the ethics of Islam and to present it in a, in a contemporary society so that the modern sort of people and uh, non-Muslims would be better be able to relate to it. Yeah, I in a nutshell. Okay, and so that sounds like a challenge. It is a very big challenge. Mm -hmm. It is a very big challenge. There are a lot of obstacles and, and stereotypes which you need to overcome, but slowly by surely, slowly and surely we, we're getting there. So uh, in this country, what I see is a rise in what I call Islamophobia. Yeah. Is it happening in England too? Uh, not so much as, uh, as across there. I mean, there was a time when there was a lot of ignorance, but now people are more educated. And there's, here there's a lot of um, initiatives to, for what they call um, community cohesion and community integration. So, community so cohesion? That's, uh, yeah, in, part, in, in UK. Okay, so, so you there's a. I'm sorry. Yeah, so there's a lot of in initiatives by the government and the local authority to bring people together, and make sure they meet and they learn from each other. So there's a lot happening to sort of overcome boundaries and barriers. Got it. So that continuum that we've talked about. Yeah. Christianity and then Islam. Can you help me understand? Does Islam um, require women to cover by wearing a black abaya or hijab? This is a very common question of students. It, it, it does from, from different, I mean, people have different interpretation, but one of the most commonly accepted is that um, they're required to have modesty uh, and to cover their heads and their, their, up to their wrists and their, up to their ankles. What they wear is very cultural. So if they wear a, a normal dress or a shirt or something, it doesn't really matter. It's just different cultures have them wearing different things. The image, images you get of, of them wearing black is um, it's just a cultural thing. Actually, it's recommended in Islam not to wear black. It's recommended to not wear black. To not wear black, yeah. Okay, but in Saudi yeah. Arabia and even Bahrain, it still is the dominant color. Yeah, it's, it's dominant color. For some reason, I, I don't know. So maybe that's the. It's it's going back to society yeah, here. Yeah, probably. I mean, a lot of Shias were, were black because they, they interpreted it as a sign of mourning for the, the son of the, gra of the, grand po of the prophet. Oh. So they were black uh, so, uh, as a sign of mourning. As a sign of so mourning. So that way, yeah, that way it comes from the Shia. The Sunnis do it for another reason. I don't know why. Okay. Now let's yeah. find out if there's anyone in our, in our class today who has a question uh -huh. they would like to ask you. Yeah, not, not difficult ones, though. <laughs> Is there anyone who has a question? Oh, good. This is Gail Beer from UMD. Nice woman. All right. Okay. Hi there. How are you? Um, you've been very kind to our students uh, from the University of Minnesota uh, Duluth, who have yeah. come to Birmingham uh, to study for a year. And I yeah. wondered if you could talk, uh, if you had any insights as, do our students approach um, the questions, the discussions they have with you differently than English university students do? Are they asking the same questions? 
Um, what is uh, your kind yeah. of feel about that? They, they, I mean, they, they are very um, inquisitive, and they ask very, um, very basic and rudimentary questions. I think because they, they haven't been exposed to, to Islam to Muslims. So whereas at the, the normal university, for example, Birmingham, people would understand certain sort of basics of Islam or, or Sikhism or Hinduism, uh, the, the students from Minnesota, they, they don't seem to understand these things. So if I go to, to lecture them or they come at our institute, they ask very basic things, you know, like where Islam originated from, why do we do this, why do we do that. They're shocked when they meet like Muslim girls who who have who are graduated from university and studied at the institution so you know the the, the very very is a they come with a lot of stereotypes and when they meet when they meet people like me who who, who are muslims and we're very contemporary is a it is a bit of a shock for the in their system you know and um they they ask a lot of questions but but very basic stuff and it is it is different because normally if you go if I go to university and I speak and I speak to a group of non-Muslims, they wouldn't ask me questions on basic Islam. They would ask me very deep philosophical questions like the nature of God, and um, democracy and all these things because here they, they already have an understanding of Islam. Whereas from the students from Minnesota, they ask you very very basic questions. Yeah, I hope I answered you. Yeah. That was super. Thank you very much, Shazam. Um, we are going to have to say goodbye now because bye bye. we're going to go chat with Miriam, inshallah. <laughs> Take care of yourself, inshallah. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Okay. So that was Shazam. There we go. Now let's try and go. Thank you, Gail, for asking a question. Typically, I'll have, a, I'll have students come right up front and then turn the laptop around, and they'll come up and look right into the camera and introduce themselves. Um, what Shazam was just saying is very much what I'm finding with the interview questions that the University of Bahraini students have asked my students. In fact, my students, when I shared with them in class on Thursday what the questions would be, they were highly insulted. And for them, because they were really pointed questions about the contradictions of American culture. <laughs> so it'll be a very interesting conversation that we're going to have. Because we were asking them, like, why do you wear black? Why do you wear a hijab? Like, what is that all about? So let's see if we can talk to Miriam, who is eight hours away. She is, uh, she's just returned from a trip to Beirut, so I'm hoping that she's there. And if not, I realize we've got five minutes left. I don't think Miriam is there. And this is perfect. I'm sad that she won't get to meet her, but it's actually perfect because welcome to Skype, <laughs> quite honestly. So you always have a backup plan. There's always something else up your sleeve. Um, Tricia, would you talk a little bit about the partnership that we're working on as another way to internationalize the curriculum? This is Tricia O'Keefe, and she works with the international students at UMD and is a fantastic um, person to work with and is a great resource for internationalizing the college curriculum. I didn't know Thank you. I was going to be doing this. Um, but I work in the International Student Services Office at UMD, and I've done lots and lots of international travel myself and know the joys and benefits of making connections with people from other countries. So um, I get a lot of requests in my office for students to come and speak to classes about uh, various things, religion, culture, uh, marriages. Brenda and I kind of connected because her class is such a... Um, obvious match um, and I and the students generally enjoy going but the students are very serious students unlike <laughs> myself and I kind of was in college I was kind of goofing off but they're often very serious about their studies and it felt like I wish that there was a way that they could get something back from this kind of partnership 
and I teach an introduction to college learning class with all international students, um, and I give them extra credit if they go to another class and do a speaking engagement, for example, but that doesn't happen in the spring semester. We don't have that many new students. So Brenda and I started partnering up in a way that um, could benefit her students and could hopefully benefit my students as well. And um, we've had some successes and some, uh, some things that need improvements, but it's a way to kind of have our students do presentations in her class, um, have uh, American students make friendships and connections and help out international students do activities with them, um, kind of get to know each other in a more personal way and hopefully develop friendships as that's one of the things I hear most from international students is that it's very difficult to make friends with American students. And I always say, well, we are Minnesotans after all. Um, and kind of tell them about trying to take risks, et cetera. But um, we're just trying to, we've just started this yeah. a few semesters and um, I think it's going well. Uh, so, but we're trying to figure out a way that her students can benefit and so can the international students by getting some locals to give them cultural um, tours or trips or so uh, we create, invites home, that kind of a thing. So the students are creating Northern Minnesota cultural immersion experiences. So taking the international students to the maple syrup farm, taking the students to the haunted ship for Halloween, like explain that holiday to people from other parts of the world. So these immersion experiences, they get this quintessential Northern Minnesota experience. Thank you. So just a few things in closing, and certainly if you have questions, um, this is a great time to ask them. But pros, it is free. They're real people in real time, like you have just experienced. It engages students in many, many, many different levels. Okay? And I would say the more you use Skype, the more I've used Skype, the more useful it is at actually connecting it to the content. But there's this whole process of, oh my god, we went abroad, and we talked to a real person who wasn't oppressed. All of that dust has to settle, and then we get to the, now let's talk about the role of religion, and let's talk about polygamy, and let's talk about arranged marriage, all right? Skype interview, never the same way twice, never ever, which makes it fun and challenging. It demystifies the other, um, it, it certainly can internationalize the curriculum, and it really, what we're finding this semester is, could be an effective tool for encouraging study abroad. Uh, cons, people have real issues. Traffic jams, people get sick. It requires lots of flexibility on the instructor's part. You really have to be willing to jump off the cliff and be okay with it not working, or with making a big mistake. Skype connection varies around the world. Um, in Bahrain, when I'm Skyping Miriam at her home, it's not as good as when I'm Skyping Shazam in England. So the bandwidth in the country does make a difference. Audio trouble at times, we have experienced that where we've had an interview set up and the audio just is not working. So we'll say, this isn't gonna happen today, let's try it again on Thursday. Time management, the clock doesn't stop ticking, so I've got 50 minutes to cover the material, get to the different country, cover what I want to do, and then get student participation. So there's lots of juggling that goes on with this. And finding the right interviewee, which is why I'm excited to talk with Mika about the alumni. How did I find Shazam? I mean, I didn't just ring up somebody in Birmingham, although you probably could do that. <laughs> you could look them up online, and then, which is kind of what I've done with John Hillis at the University of Bahrain. So we've been working at establishing this relationship so that we're ready to have this conversation student to student, but it does take time. Finding someone who's articulate, credible, reliable. Um, it is best to pre-teach with the interviewee, give them a list of questions, tell them what your objective is, ask them if they can partner with you. At the end of the day, what are you trying to accomplish? Which is what Dr. Hillis and I had to do Friday when I, when I Skyped him and said, my students are really mad at your students because they asked some really hard questions that they don't want to answer. And so I said, at the end of the day, what are we trying to do? And now that we have this understanding, it'll be fine. And I feel confident about that. Um, so there's Shazam. These are some of the questions. We're going to plow through this. Here's Miriam. And I am sorry that she's not available this morning. And this is really Skype. The goals, some of the outcomes I wanted to use it effectively, um, to meet the goals, and then I wanted to evaluate it. So this is feedback that I collected on uh, December 7th at the end of the semester, fall semester, and I asked students to, they use Scantron sheets, and then they also used a piece of paper and a pencil to give me some open-ended feedback. 
So overall, I think Skype, using Skype to interview guest speakers around the world helped internationalize the curriculum. 93, there are 89 students who were there that day who responded, and 93% of them said yes. Um, this question, did it add to the course content? 76% said yes. This is anonymous feedback. They, I don't know who it is. I don't ask for IDs or any of that. Overall, I think Skype, using Skype to connect with Shazam and Miriam helped me learn more about marriage and family practices. It's down. It's 60%. I'm shooting for 80 to 85%. So that, I think, is a reflection of me and how I have to better do that background work before we introduce the speakers. Um, I think using Skype to meet the in interview Shazam helped improve my understanding of Islam and Muslim culture, 52%. And I directly attribute this to the conversation we had with Shazam in class that day. The audio was horrible. <laughs> so it did not surprise me. It got students curious, which I think is another beneficial educational outcome. Um, it piqued my curiosity about life outside the U.S., 75%, which is fantastic. 55%, it got me more interested in studying abroad, which is then built. We use this to build on the project that we're doing this semester with um, the study abroad office. Do I think it can be an educational tool? 89%. So I thought that is really worth pursuing in my mind. Um, should the instructor keep using it? 79% said, yeah. So I thought, wow, even with the audio trouble we had, and one day Miriam got, didn't make it to the computer, and still 80% thought it was, it was useful. And then I asked them to give me some specific feedback. How could I use it more effectively in the classroom? Make sure the connection, make sure to connect the interview contact with the curriculum. I would never try this in a class that I just started teaching. I've been teaching this class for seven years. Now I know the content. Now I can easily connect the dots to what the interviewer is saying and saying, you know what, that sounds like the marriage gradient. Remember we talked in chapter two about the marriage gradient? But I would never do that with a new class because I wouldn't know the material well enough. Um, have a test run prior to class, which is what I was doing this morning and what I typically do before I use it in class now. Interview different people in different countries and ask the same question. So you get this really different answer. And they're both Muslims. <laughs> Miriam would have given you a very different answer. Include the information from Skype interviews on the following tests. I would never have thought of that. But if you want students to answer, yes, the instructor is spending time in a worthwhile manner in class, connect it to the test. It makes great sense. Talk with the cultural context prior to the interview. Prepare them for it. The interviewees must stay focused. This goes right back to an interview I did with Miriam and Mary in Bahrain. And they, we did Skype. And for them, it was 2.30 in the morning. And they had both had way too much coffee. And so by the time we got to them, they looked like they were high. <laughs> And I was shocked. I was like, ah, you people look like you're intoxicated or on speed or something. <laughs> so um, yes, that was the feedback from students. Use a predetermined set of questions. If all planets line up just right, I do think Skype can be an effective educational tool. The end. Thank you. So any questions?